in terms of operations, the Vatican Bank, it seems like a cross between a central bank and an offshore bank. So can you tell us what exactly is the Vatican Bank? Yeah, Aaron, you're exactly right. It is a cross between the two, but if it has its true nature, its real heart and soul, is an offshore bank and just happens to be operating in the middle of a foreign capital. It's a bank created in the middle of World War II by the Vatican as a sovereign nation, and that's the thing I think that's so key. It's not just one of the world's biggest religions, but also happens to be a sovereign country. So when they created the bank in the middle of the war, they've run it for the past 70 years in the dark, total secrecy, except for the last few years when reform started, no one's able to see who has accounts there and what money's going through it. Now, you just mentioned it was created during World War II, but can you give myself and the viewers a brief history, quick history of the Vatican Bank? Yeah, I mean, this is the, the most amazing part to me when I started doing the, this work was here's a 2,000-year-old institution that really relied on raising donations. And for a long time, there were Pope kings. You know, the popes also had their own secular empire, and then they lost that in the late 1800s. They didn't get their sovereignty back until they got it from Benito Mussolini, the fascist dictator of Italy, when the two, the Vatican, the church, and the fascists struck an accord in 1929. And then all of a sudden, this 2,000-year-old institution in the middle of World War II in 1942 decides with the pope and the guy who's running their finances to form this, as you called it, quasi-central bank, called the Vatican Bank. And it, it is really formed to stay off the radar for British and American intelligence who are trying their hardest to stop countries like the Vatican, sovereign little uh, neutral countries, from dealing with the Nazis. They were able, the Vatican was able to keep doing business with the Germans through the entire war as a result of having that bank. And in subsequent decades, it became the primary bank for political slush funds, for Italy's conservative politicians, for the mafia using uh, all types of funds, for illegal proceeds, and for money launderers, and for people dodging taxes. So it's just been an outlier bank that happens to be run by the Roman Catholic Church that's just sitting inside Vatican City. It only has one branch. That's the branch in Vatican City. It's nowhere else. It only has one person it answers to, the Pope. He's the single shareholder. It has no responsibility in its charter to turn a profit, and it doesn't make loans like a traditional bank. So it's an unusual amalgam. It's really fascinating. And, you know, I have to say, you just mentioned some of the ways, but how exactly did the Vatican Bank it, it evolve from this rudimentary financial institution relying mostly on donations into an institution that now rivals Wall Street investment banks? Is it all nefarious money? Well, it's not all nefarious money. That's clear. I mean, a lot of the money in there, Vatican charities are the largest charities in the world. So billions of dollars a year go through those charities. Religious orders, priests, people working in Vatican City, they all had accounts at the Vatican Bank. Those were all legit. But one of the things that marked the Vatican Bank unique from the very beginning was it accepted physical deposits. That meant that at the end of World War II, the Croatian fugitives, the war criminals who had looted the Croatian National Bank and the Treasury of hundreds of millions of dollars of gold bars, they brought it to a priest who was running a seminary in Rome, and he brought it on trucks, some 10 truckloads, deposited into the Vatican Bank. That means that the, the doctor to Mussolini, when he had his own gold, gold stash, some of it looted gold from World War II victims, wanted to deposit it, he put it into the Vatican Bank. And one of the great things it had going for it, Aaron, is that if you were in Italy, you were a wealthy Italian, you were a mobster, you were a money launderer, you're standing on a street corner. For those of you who know Vatican City, it doesn't have a wall around it. It's not separated from the rest of Rome. So if you're on this street corner, all you have to do is cross the street when the light turns green, and you cross from one country into another. You go from Rome and Italy into Vatican City. So if you can take a truck loaded with millions of dollars of cash and find a cleric inside the Vatican City who wants to deposit that money for you and take a commission for doing it, you just need to deposit that on that truck. It'll go into Vatican City, and once it gets into the Vatican Bank, poof, it disappears. It's in the black. What that meant is no wire transfer. So as opposed to the Caymans and all the other offshore banks in Liechtenstein and those that are happening in the Bahamas and in Hong Kong, there's no wire transfer for investigators to follow. You made a physical deposit. It was off the radar. And that's one of the reasons it was such a great offshore bank. It's really fascinating stuff. And, uh, you know, you mentioned before the bank, it doesn't make any loans and it isn't for profit. So what exactly is its charter and or its purpose? Well, its charter and purpose is that it's only supposed to accept money that's going to go on to do good and, and, and holy deeds, essentially. It should be in the business of running charities, and that's where it got abused. I'll give you a, a perfect example. 
Italy's most prominent and powerful post-World War II politician, who many of your listeners know, uh, Giulio Andriotti, he died about a year ago. He was seven times prime minister. What did he end up having? We now know he had an account inside the Vatican Bank called the Cardinal Spellman Foundation, named after the Cardinal in New York, who was one of the most powerful American cardinals. There was no Cardinal Spellman Foundation outside of the one in the Vatican Bank. It didn't exist anywhere in the world, but it was created as a charitable account inside the bank. It was run by a Monsignor who was a friend of Andriotti, and through that fund, Andriotti ran some $60 million that he paid off everything from his wife's Florentine jeweler to friends to political payoffs. So this is how the Vatican Bank has been misused used over the years. Today, as we speak on, on April the 1st, the Vatican just announced that it struck a deal with Italian authorities after many years to strike a tax-sharing information. The Italians have wanted this for a long time. You know, the, the process is rolling out that eventually what has been an outlaw type of bank, an outlier bank in the middle of Rome, is getting corralled in a little bit by new rules. And we're seeing the reforms take place that may eventually turn it into an ordinary financial institution moving forward. Now, in your book, you talk about how the Vatican worked closely with German companies during World War II. So can you talk to me about the, the bundling of life insurance policies of Jewish refugees who had been sent to Auschwitz? This particular part of your story truly shocked me. Uh, you know, it, it truly shocked me as well because I came across it through building the story in the National Archives and documents in Romanian and Czechoslovakian and Polish archives as well about the companies that did business with the Vatican. For years, the rumor has been that the Vatican did business with the Third Reich, but nobody could prove it. The Vatican has always denied it. And when restitution lawsuits and claims were made in the 90s by victims, the Vatican participated in the conferences but never paid a penny because it said time and again, Aaron, that it had nothing to do and it did no profit. What I think this book does is, for the first time, it shows people how the Vatican did business with the Germans, primarily through investments in insurance companies, German insurers and Italian insurance companies. They held stakes in which they earned outsized profits because in 1943 and 1944, companies like Allianz Insurance, Munich Reinsurance, uh, Generali, the biggest Italian insurer, they sat around a table and they said, hey, We've got the life insurance policies of all these Jews who ended up at death camps. They've got a cash value to them. If we essentially cheat them now, we take them off the books, we take the cash value out, we'll increase our profits. They aren't coming back to claim them. And they did that, and their profits were enormous. After the war, when the victims' families showed up and said, by the way, my parent had a life insurance policy here, those same companies said, show us a death certificate, knowing that that was impossible. So can I prove to you, Aaron, that the Pope knew about what was happening in terms of the profits and the achievement of life insurance policies for Holocaust victims or the head of the bank did inside the Vatican? I can't, but I actually think that from my research, they didn't want to know. They just wanted to know enormous profits were flowing in. And one thing to remember is the Vatican bet both sides. They bet on the Americans by investing in American stocks and putting gold over here. They bet on the British by buying real estate in downtown and in central London that they still owe to this day that's very valuable. And they also invested in the Italians and Germans. We shouldn't be surprised. They were equal opportunity profiteers. And in the end, when they saw the war going against the uh, Germans in 44, they started to cut their ties, hid the information, kept it inside the bank. I've called on Pope Francis to release the church's World War II Vatican bank files. Only silence from the Vatican so far in that request. Such incredible stuff. Now, can you lay out some of the other examples, the ones that really stick out in your mind, of the blood money deals that the church has engaged in over the years? You've mentioned a couple yeah, already, know, but the ones that really just blow uh, your socks off. Uh, uh, Okay, the one that blew my socks off is not just that the church did blood money deals, but that the church also did, and through the Vatican Bank, this is critical to it, political deals. We think of this as just religion, power, or money, but of course, it's the Roman Catholic Church and it's a country and politics are involved. So where does the Vatican Bank get involved? In 46, it's involved with the American and British intelligence to move Nazi war criminals to South America. Klaus Barbie, the butcher of Lyon, who is responsible for killing uh, people all over in, in that French occupation, taken by American intelligence and moved to South America. And how, what do we do? We drop him off in Genoa at a train station where he's picked up by a Catholic priest who's running a seminary and his priest who move him down to South America. He's met by other priests. The Vatican Bank provides the money. 
Who provides the money? Millions of dollars in covert aid from the CIA goes through the Vatican Bank for the first post-war elections in Italy in 1948, in which the Christian Democrats defeat the communists. The Pope at the time absolutely adamant the communists should go down in defeat. And what happens in 1978? The Polish, a Polish cardinal becomes Pope, Pope, Pope John Paul II, and he forms an alliance. Margaret Thatcher becomes the Prime Minister of England four months later. Ronald Reagan comes in. Those three have a political alliance to bring down communism in the Iron Curtain. And again, millions of dollars flow through the Vatican Bank back to Solidarity and other units. I recount an episode in, in this book in which a priest drives an SUV from Rome to Gdansk that has a false side and false bottom stuffed with $3.3 million in gold ingots from Credit Suisse, all funneled Vatican Bank assistance together with the CIA. So the Vatican Bank plays a role that gets at the protection of Western intelligence agencies at the same time that it serves as a repository for criminals and outliers and tax cheats. Now, let's talk about transparency for a second. You say that the Vatican Bank is one of the top banks in the world for money laundering. So my question is, why? And basically, I mean, are there any moral restrictions for the bank in terms of whom or what they'll launder money for? Yes. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, one of the things, uh, and I quote an uh, uh, Italian businessman who was a very close associate of the Vatican Bank who ends up, unfortunately for him, dead of cyanide poisoning in an Italian jail cell two days after he's convicted. <laughs> um, but before he dies of cyanide poisoning, which the Italians uh, deem officially as suicide, even though they had him in a special wing of the prison, under 24-hour guard, and his food was prepared in a special part of the kitchen, then sealed in containers and brought to him with somebody watching as he opened it. Somehow, somebody still managed to poison him, or he killed himself. But before he died, he said that when he was working with the Vatican Bank, they drew this distinction, that if the money was just from somebody who was uber-wealthy and wanted to avoid paying Italian taxes, and they put their honestly earned money inside the Vatican Bank, that was all right. But if it came from extortion or drug deals or somebody running a, uh, an entire operation that was illegal, then the Vatican Bank looked askance at that. But both have ended up being put there. The difference is that this bank is being changed against its own will in some ways because they have no choice. And what I mean by that is, in 1999, Italy decided to adopt the euro, the common currency. Once it did that, Aaron, the Vatican had to decide what to do because it relied on the lira for its own currency, which made the money laundering between Italy and the Vatican much easier. It decided not to issue its own currency, but to go with the euro. What they didn't realize inside the church at that time was that decision meant that they were going to be subject to financial evaluators being sent from Brussels to look at the Vatican Bank to make sure it was a compliant bank. And guess what? It had no law against money laundering. They didn't pass one until 2011. It had no laws against the financing of terrorism. They didn't pass it until 2011. They had no restrictions on the amount of cash you could bring into the Vatican. 10,000 euros or $10,000 didn't exist. They passed those in 2012. So money value evaluators have been there. Brussels is pushing them to become a compliant bank. Francis is putting in the reforms. But in many ways, they have no choice. The bad old days are probably just history now. Now, in 2013, Pope Francis began reforming and modernizing the Vatican Bank. You mentioned it before. So how are those reforms going? Francis's reforms are going along well. And, you know, in the beginning, when he took office in 2013, he said, I'm going to reform the finances of the Vatican. And I was a skeptic because I know by the, studying the last 200-year history of the finances of the Vatican that popes come in all the time saying, I'm going to reform the finances. There are real problems here. And sometimes in the past, Aaron, they have reformed. Like in the 1960s, there was a pope, Pope Paul VI, who made a major change in the bureaucracy of the finances of the church thinking it was going to be better, it actually worsened the situation, created more bureaucracy and more areas for secrecy. So sometimes the reforms are well-intentioned, just don't turn out very well. I think Francis's heart is in the right place. I think he is putting into place the reforms to move it along very aggressively. The question that I have for him is that if he is going to reform the Vatican finances and the Vatican Bank moving forward, fantastic. But will he also have the courage as the Pope to be able to apply some transparency to the Vatican Bank's history. Will he release the Holocaust era files or the Vatican Bank's World War II files? Remember, in the Vatican, we are talking about 
a non-hereditary absolute monarchy. That's what it really is. There's no judicial system. There's, there's no checks and balances in, in terms of the legislature. The word of the pope is final. It's a true monarchy. It just happened is that they're elected when one dies or one resigns, as in the case of Benedict. So he can do whatever he wants. He can order the release of those files with a single decree, and nobody can overturn him. If Francis really wants the reformer cape that he seems to want, then I'm hoping he'll clear up some of the past questions, some of them that I've raised, and he'll also reform going forward as well.